So, um, welcome and good afternoon to you all. Thank you for joining this Lunchtime Morgan Hunt webinar session on navigating restructures and best practices for employers. Today we'll explore restructuring and redundancy situations and as we all know this can be a really challenging time for both employees and for organisations. So we'll look at how best to support individuals through the process, how to manage organisational reputation, how to support employee morale and of course the potential legal risks involved. Uh, my name is Claire Canary and I'm a board director at Morgan Hunt and I also lead on diversity and inclusion. And as a leading UK recruitment business at Morgan Hunt, we regularly support organisations and employees through restructuring projects. And I'm really delighted this afternoon to be joined by two experts in their field. Suzanne Penny, who is a learning and development consultant and a career coach. She has extensive experience providing support to both individuals and to organisations through the redundancy process. Having worked with market leading outplacement organisations, Suzanne now offers outplacement and career development training to businesses and to individuals. And she also partners with us at Morgan Hunt on outplacement projects with our own clients. We're also joined today by Heather Ost, a qualified employment law specialist who is a partner at CG Professional in Manchester. She provides support to clients across a wide range of industries. Heather works as part of a client's internal team, advising on day-to-day -day HR workplace issues and larger restructures, and of course, on legal matters. Recently, Heather has focused on undertaking project work specifically involving outsourcing and restructuring, where the focus has been on employee relations, 2P compliance and managing redundancies. So before we quick kick off our, our conversation this, this afternoon, I just wanted to run through a quick note on our format today. The webinar will last just an hour. If you do have any questions for us, please post those in the Q&A function on Teams at any point during this session. We will see your questions and we will endeavour to answer as many as possible, time allowing. And I do aim to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of our initial discussion to answer your questions. So to kick off our conversation, Heather, if I can come to you from a legal perspective, what is the difference or the relevance of the term restructure as opposed to redundancy? Thanks, Claire. Um, redundancy from a legal perspective does have quite a strict definition. So there's three scenarios that can fall within the legal definition of a redundancy. The first is a business closure. So the employer, the organisation ceases to trade um, altogether. Relatively rare, but obviously would impact all of the employees in that sort of scenario. The second is a workplace closure. So not the complete business closure, but that particular branch site or place of work is closing down and that can amount to a redundancy situation for those employees based there. And then the third one, which is perhaps the most common, is just where there's a reduced need for employees to do that particular type of work. So that's your classic where you might have a sales team of 10 people and unfortunately due to market conditions we feel like we can only really support five we're going from 10 to 5 to do that particular type of role and um, that would be a third type of redundancy situation restructure on the other hand doesn't really have a set legal definition from an employment law perspective and that generally means something that's not quite as drastic as one of those three scenarios but you're otherwise reorganizing the way that you deliver work and that impacts employees so it might be that actually you're not reducing headcounts, you're not looking at losing any employees, but actually the roles are changing slightly or people need to be realigned, reporting lines, that sort of thing. So a restructure doesn't necessarily mean that you're um, making redundancies, but often the two things go hand in hand. Right, okay. And Heather, just to kind of, I suppose, complete the introduction or, um, complete what, what you've just told us. What's the, the kind of legal definition of redundancy itself? So redundancy is those um, 
one of those three. So we're looking workplace closure, business closure, or diminished um, requirement for employees to do work of a particular kind. So that definition is found in the Employment Rights Act, um, and it will state that it would be one of those three scenarios. Redundancy, importantly, is one of the potential fair reasons to dismiss. So it's also found in the Employment Rights Act when you're looking at unfair dismissal rights and alongside things like conduct and capability, it amounts to a fair reason to dismiss. So the legal definition is relevant for those purposes, as well as obviously establishing a right to a statutory redundancy payment if the eligibility criteria are met. Right, that makes sense. Thank you, Heather. And Suzanne, from your perspective, you know, supporting organisations and individuals through redundancy and restructure, which you've got a lot of experience of, would you talk us through, you know, the outplacement process and what that typically involves for an organisation and, and for individuals? Um, and interestingly, I was in a room of um, small business owners only a few weeks ago, and none of them knew what outplacement was. However, what I'm finding is there's a lot more awareness about the benefits of providing career transition support to departing employees. Outplacement is it's expert support in terms of career coaching. Sometimes life coaching comes into this too. Um, some outplacement uh, specialists will also have mental health and well-being qualifications to be able to help people uh, to navigate the next chapter. And we, we, we go into organisations and we work with individuals to help them through various stages um, from redundancy. So that could be thinking about um, career clarity, could be thinking about how to navigate change and resilience. It can be helping people get aware of their strengths, their achievements. It can be the kind of nitty gritty job search, CVs, interview skills, LinkedIn support. A lot of it is also around empowering and confidence because when it comes to redundancy, some people can really take it personally. Um, so therefore, there can be quite a lot on, on mindset, coaching people into new roles. And then there's also the transition into that new role. So, for example, I support managers and leaders thinking about how to go in with their new team and lead their new team effectively. Some organisations also ask us with redeployment to to help individuals if they haven't had an interview for a while or if they want to be able to reapply to a role, uh, we help them with a redeployment scenario as well. Thank you, Suzanne. And Heather, um, what are the legal considerations and requirements that organisations in the UK need to be aware of um, when they're planning or indeed executing a redundancy process? So I suppose specifically, you know, to ensure that they comply with employment laws and regulations? So I'd probably say, Claire, the first thing that they want to bear in mind is they will usually start with what's their existing structure look like and, and what is their ideal new structure going to look like? And in doing that, they'll look at the number of people that they're affecting um, and obviously all of all of the uh, requirements that go with that. From a legal perspective, the key thing for me is how many people are you potentially proposing to dismiss? Um, so it might be like you say that there's more people impacted, but actually less people that you're actually looking to reduce the headcount of. So again, going back to my example, if it's nice and straightforward, a sales team of 10 and in your new structure, there's only a sales team of five, then you'd be proposing to make five people redundant potentially. And it is obviously just a proposal at that stage. If you are proposing to dismiss 20 or more people at any one establishment within a 90 day period or less, then collective consultation obligations kick in. So there is a whole raft of legislation around collective consultation um, and they will need to make sure that they are complying with those, those requirements. If you're looking at less than 20 employees, in my example, you, you tend to five um, sales team, then you're just looking at um, obligations to those individuals and looking at whether they have unfair dismissal rights. If they've been employed for two years or more, then um, certainly you want to make sure that you are following um, a fair and proper process in uh, potentially making those dismissals. 
you also want to be making sure that you've got in mind what legal entitlements those individuals will have if they are selected for redundancy. So statutory redundancy payments. If I was uh, preparing or planning a redundancy exercise, I'd want to know how much it's going to cost me. Um, so what, what are those um, redundancy payments? Have they got any entitlements to any contractual enhanced redundancy schemes? And if so, what, what do they look like? And obviously these individuals will have the right to notice um, if they are um, dismissed by reason of redundancy. So again, looking at their notice periods, um, do they have an entitlement to a month's notice, three months notice, six months notice? And again, factoring that in um, to the process. And then ultimately, the key thing really is you need to be consulting with the impacted employees about that proposal before any decisions are made. And that's part of a fair and proper process, whether we're just talking about a few couple of individuals or a wider scale, scale process. And a key part will be considering alternatives. Um, so, you know, I'm assuming that um, uh, when we've got to this point that they're, they're, they're saying, you know, there is going to be a redundancy process. So there is going to be a reduction in the number. But have we have we looked at alternatives? Have we already done some things to try and whether it be reduce cost or work more efficiently before we've got here? And can we communicate that to the employees so they understand why we're in the situation we're in? And are there alternatives? So whether it's alternative um, vacancies, looking at what other roles might exist and tying in there with Suzanne's point about other redeployment opportunities um, and thinking about what, what roles might be available for certain individuals that are at risk. Great, thank you, Heather. And what in your experience, Suzanne, are some of the kind of key challenges that employees face when they're navigating redundancy? So I suppose, you know, when you meet them, what are they going through? What what are the challenges they're having at, at that point? Yeah, and I've, we've just been partnering with Morgan Hunt on an outplacement project, and this was kind of at the consultation stage, and people were saying, you know, I, the thought of going out on the job market is really scary. People that haven't had a job uh, a job interview for many many years were petrified. One lady messaged me and, and, and said on a webinar I was running that she had huge anxiety at the thought of going for an interview. And there's this kind of fear of the unknown. And I often see career transition. It's almost like you're on you're on this journey. You know that you could be heading somewhere. You don't know where you're definitely heading. You don't know how long it's going to take you to get there. And there's all these kind of choppy waves that come at you in terms of financial situation. Some people are, you know, live month to month and they don't have savings in the bank for a rainy day. Um, so there's the finances, there's um, mental health and well-being. So statistics show that people impacted by redundancy are five times more likely to suffer mental health challenges. So that aspect comes into it as well. Um, and as we said, then there's this whole kind of, well, what can I do? And when if, if you if we think like with neuroscience, our brains are wired to keep us safe. So staying in the comfort zone keeps us safe. When we step outside of that comfort zone to think about a new job, imposter syndrome comes at rife. And with imposter syndrome comes an army of limiting beliefs. So I often work with with professionals who will say, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm worried that I'm not as good as I think I am, or I'm worried that this feels a bit personal redundancy. Um, and it, it's really affected that confidence and well-being. So the outplacement process, we get to support people through a difficult time. And redundancy um, is actually said to be one of the top five most stressful life events people go through. And if we've ever been on the re receiving end of change being done to us, it's a lot more uncomfortable than we're if we're in, in control of that. Um, and sometimes it's like that relationship ending. If we're in control of, of ending something, it's more comfortable. So not only have they got the practical elements of redundancy to deal with, from finances to thinking about their next steps, they've also got imposter syndrome, well-being and navigating change. So it's that loss. It's that what was. Um, and that we see that right the way through with people with the consultation stage wondering whether they're going to be staying or not. The uncomfortable aspect of going, as they say, you know, going up against other colleagues for the, for job interviews. 
um, right the way through to when they exit having support for them. So there's lots of challenges that people face when it comes to redundancy. Yeah, and it's very hard not to take it personally uh, for an individual. So you can see why that that is so emotional. And as you say, then it's the conflict with dealing with the practicalities at the same time. Um, and Heather, you mentioned consultation. So can you give us an idea typically how long a consultation should last for? Is there a set period of time or does that that differ? There's a set minimum period of time if we're in that collective realm. If we're talking about we're proposing to dismiss 20 or more, then there's a minimum consultation period of 30 days. If you're looking at 100 or more, then it's at least 45 days. Um, the reality is, as I say, um, for businesses that are proposing to dismiss a much smaller number, it, it, it generally, in my view, should take a minimum of two weeks, three weeks. Um, so before long, you're not that far short of the 30 days. And actually, a lot of employers might sort of use that as a bit of a um, go to, even if it's less than 20. There's no hard and fast rules from an unfair dismissal perspective, but you have to have have enough time to show that you've meaningfully consulted and you've looked at those alternatives. And obviously most um, employers do want to um, have regards to the impact on the individual and the time that they've got to potentially transition and deal with this information. And picking up on that personal element, from, from a legal perspective, it's actually, we would want to try and get across that this is about the role, not the individual, and it's a no fault dismissal. This should absolutely not be about poor performance. Um, it's, it's not an opportunity to, um, you know, get, get rid of the weakest people, really. It's not, it's not that, it's not, shouldn't be approached in that way. Yes, there might be selection criteria that have regard to people's skills and things like that, a disciplinary record or appraisal scores and that sort of thing. But generally, this should be about the role and something that's happening at the business level that is dictating a need for change. Um, and um, it's, you know, it's it's absolutely not not personal, but I appreciate that it can't help but um, uh, feel like that sometimes. But from a legal perspective, it is absolutely a no fault dismissal um, and it should be, the focus should be on roles. So I always encourage employers, if they're looking at an existing org chart and a new org chart, there's no names on there, it's job titles. Yeah, it's focusing on that role rather than the person who's doing the role at the time. Yeah, that's a, it's a good, you know, a, a really good tip. And Heather, what are the, the pros and cons for organisations who might consider also offering, you know, voluntary redundancy during a process? Well, that, you know, it touches on Suzanne's point about control. Uh, you know, I understand that it's very uncomfortable for people to be put at risk of redundancy. And I, ha you know, I have. I have been through it once um, and you're absolutely right. I had advised on it for years at that point. And uh, when it happens to you, it feels different than than, than you expect, even though, um, you know, I was in a point of safety, but I still had to go through a process. Um, so the reality is that offering people voluntary redundancy, it means that they feel they have got that control and um, it feels nicer. You know, they have chosen, they appreciate there is a redundancy situation, but for whatever their personal circumstances, it works OK for them. And at least like Suzanne said as well, from a financial perspective, um, they can sort of have some control over when this is going to happen, how much money I'm going to get and um, feel that they that they've got time to be comfortable with it. They've chosen to apply for voluntary redundancy. So there, there are definite um, benefits, I think, from a, a employee engagement perspective and from the impact on that individual that employers should and, and generally are aware of. Um, I think the downsides can be that um, you don't, you might, um, lose people or people might volunteer that you really don't want to lose and so that would potentially lead you to want to reject an application for voluntary redundancy um, you would want to have discretion over whether you accept a, a, a volunteer for redundancy because what if actually I only wanted to lose five salespeople and now they've all volunteered to go 
it doesn't say great things about the organisation, but equally, you know, then you've got to choose between the 10 people that have all um, applied and you, and you only want to lose five. Um, and again, you have to be conscious about discrimination risk around that potentially and, and, and other risk factors and just the lack of engagement. Then if I've applied and I've decided in my head I'm going and then I get turned down, am I likely to then, you know, leave at some point or I've, I've lost that, that that connection with you anyway? It can also be um, potentially more costly because generally um, employers will offer an enhancement to volunteers. So if all an employee is going to get by volunteering is what they'd be legally entitled to anyway, they'll probably say, I'll take my chance because I would rather stay in my role and keep my financial position secure. And um, I just don't want the risk of, of being compulsorily made redundant and only getting these small payments at some point where I've got no control over it. Whereas often voluntary redundancy, an employer might say, if you want to volunteer, we will enhance it, we'll give you an additional one month's pay or whatever it might be. Um, because ultimately there is then the benefit to the employer of potentially not having to complete the consultation exercise. You know, in an ideal world, I want to reduce my headcount by five, I get five volunteers, I'm happy to accept them all, then hopefully everyone sort of got what they want with, you know, within the, the, the difficult situation that you're in. Yeah, that makes sense. And it, you know, saves a lot of time and energy and emotional energy, probably for the individual and, and the organisation going through that. Um, Suzanne, in terms of outplacement, um, in your opinion and experience, you know, how do you see outplacement helping both employers and employees? So, you know, I suppose it's there are organisations out there. I think we were talking just before we came live and the recent ACAS survey um, has that about 30% of employers over the coming 12 months are likely to make redundancies. So, but not all of those may offer outplacement or they may not have heard of it or thought about it. So what are the benefits that organisations should consider in terms of providing outplacement support to employees as part of a process, in your opinion? There's there's obviously the benefits for departing employees, as we've spoken about, and um, and and even even there on our last webinar, I, I did a webinar with you, Claire, some time ago, and I had two ladies reach out to me who had been on the job market for twelve months, twelve months, and they then reached out for coaching and secured a role. But you can imagine after twelve months of being on a, on the job market, the the confidence that that uh, is affected. But it's not just the individuals. We, um, um, I hope hopefully I've spoken about the benefits to individuals affected. There's huge benefits for those left behind, and also to the employer's reputation. So. And Heather, you said that, you know, you, you've experienced redundancy. I've experienced it twice in my career, too. And one organisation where this wasn't a redundancy situation, but the senior leadership team flew over to the UK and made a third of the office redundant. There was no opportunity for voluntary redundancy and there was no consultation period. It was literally pack your bag, you're off. Um, and we saw a huge ripple effect with employees remaining that did no longer want to be there. So had had there been a, a consultation period where they had seen it being done correctly, had they had the opportunity for voluntary redundancy, I think that would have made a difference because we then saw people remaining that didn't want to, to stay. Um, but also employees that were remaining, they were horrified at the way that their colleagues had been treated, that they'd had no support to help them transition. Um, they also uh, had we, I, I saw them clearly go through their own phase of guilt uh, they, and they call it survivor's guilt. So their own phase of loss and grief of what was. They then had a lot more workload because they had to do more with less people. They then had restructures in their teams. So just trying to um, kind of get used to new team members and, and new ways of working. And there was no development support for those people remaining. And we've all seen on the news the last, certainly the last year, last two years of organisations, big names out there who have not done redundancy well at all. And it's massively, think about the impact of their employer brand. And we know that talent shortages are going to be staying. They're, they're here to stay because we've seen 
a lot of people leave the job market um, over the last couple of years. So with these talent shortages that will remain, employer employer reputation is, is, is crucial. Um, but I've also had some individuals recently say because their employers off boarded with so much care, if in the future the door is open, they would look to go back. Yeah, that's really important. And you're right, you know, um, lots of over 50s leaving the jobs market. We, you know, despite the fact um, that, you know, it's it feels a little bit un um, economically uncertain at the moment, we've still got record um, employment and record vacancies, over a million vacancies, and that still is a massive skill shortage. So I think it's a really big consideration for organisations to think about. And what tips have you got? You mentioned survivor's guilt, Suzanne, and, and that makes complete sense. And uh, somebody feeling, you know, equally, you'll, you'll have colleagues that will have gone and friends that will have maybe gone through a process. So what tips have you got for organisations and employers in terms of supporting the remaining employees uh, during the transition and probably, you know, after the transition so that they feel um, loyal to the organisation, even though they weren't affected? Yeah, so in my experience, giving them support in terms of, well, communicating the why it had to happen. So ensuring that leaders are equipped on how to navigate and lead through change and uncertainty, clear communication about the why and or about the change curve, how to help people get through the change curve swiftly so that productivity does not dip so much. So that can be some key support that um, organisations can give. Then there's also, um, we know that people remaining, um, like I said, there's going to be new teams, there's going to be new ways of working. So ensuring that they are equipped with learning and development or training if it's needed, um, having a space for people to be able to go to to discuss if they are struggling with loss of um, colleagues, etc. Um, so resilience coaching can be really beneficial or training around that. Navigating change and resilience, hugely beneficial because change takes place. Um, and equipping them to be able to be agile for more change that's coming because we often see if there are restructures more change comes uh, with that so navigating that can be really beneficial um, and and I think for me for employees remaining behind things like job crafting is getting popular whereby organizations are really wanting to support employees because if they've made restructures they don't want other people to leave so thinking about identifying individual strengths what they're good at what they really enjoy and could they craft that role a little bit to enhance their skills and strengths to enhance uh, job satisfaction there. I think that's another one, Claire, that I would add in. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. Just a quick note to everyone on the webinar. If you do have any questions, please just post them in the Q&A and we'll, like I said at the beginning, we'll try and leave some time at the end to, to deal with any questions that come up as, you, as you're listening. So Heather, if I could come back to you. Um, how should employers deal with employees who may be on maternity leave or, or sick leave? during a, a restructuring and redundancy process. What's your advice in terms of that? Well, um, obviously it can cause some practical difficulties. Hopefully now people are used to potentially holding meetings and having conversations uh, remotely like we're doing now. And um, those people may still be able to engage um, just in a different way. It's absolutely imperative that they do get this sort of same information at the same time if possible, um, depending on the reason for the absence, um, such as someone being off sick, that may not be practical, um, uh, but it should absolutely be considered. In terms of um, maternity, adoption or shared parental leave, there is a specific legal requirement that people need to be aware of, which is that those individuals would get priority for any suitable alternative vacancies if a redundancy dismissal would take place during their period of leave. Um, there is um, planned change with regards to extending that protection. So um, potentially from the point at which an individual advises um, their employer of their pregnancy in the case of maternity um, until um, 
six months after the end of their leave. So it could be um, a, a longer period of protection than we've got at the moment. We're waiting for a private member's bill on that. So watch this space. So um, people and it does maternity leave is the most common one and um, that can impact the actual legal process um, of appointing people to suitable alternative roles but generally people that are absent just try and make sure that we still engage with them that we've talked to them about how we communicate um, and depending on the point at which and for how long they've been off at the time will obviously depend how how, how uh, appropriate that is but the worst thing that you can do is just forget about the person that's absent because they've been on maternity for six months you're going through a process and and they come back and their role's not there and um, that's um absolutely to be avoided at all costs yeah and actually that's something that's been in the news a lot post pandemic and even during the pandemic um it was it seems like there were there were a number of employers out there who um you know didn't maybe consider employees particularly on maternity leave um and which seems like a real a real dropping the ball on their part. Heather, do most, I mean, this is just a question, do, do you, in your experience, are most employers taking legal advice or are they kind of, you know, are they going out and, and actively asking for legal advice and engaging with organisations like yourself? What, what's your take on that? I mean, obviously, I generally see the people that do, which is good, and, yeah. and 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 making sure they get that advice at an early stage is 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 helpful. Yes, I do sometimes see the fallout where they've maybe not taken advice, and and it does tend to be where they've got caught out either by maybe it tipping into collective consultation and they didn't realise, and um, them not doing the search for suitable alternative correctly. There's all sorts of funny quirks about um, you know the 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 right to time off to attend interviews for other jobs and things like that and um, the fact that the the obligation to continue searching continues during a notice period and um, there's all sorts of funny quirks that even if employees feel like I've got a general sense and you know I will talk to them a bit about the redundancy and I will pay them a statutory redundancy payment and those sorts of things and um, there are things that can slip and it does tend to be the quirks that catch people out but unfortunately like Suzanne said there have been some big names that have either taken the risk or or, or, or sort of purposefully um, decide that even though there's things that they should do from a legal perspective they they're not going to do them um, and or because they feel that people have generally got less than two years service and um, they have lim more limited rights to uh, redress and they will just make mass calls um, but the 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 thankfully they are relatively few and far between um, and we do generally hear about them through the press or in the House of Commons getting um, yeah. criticised. Yes indeed yeah not a good way to be noticed and um, Suzanne from from your experience you know uh, I know that you've done a lot of ad placement and supporting individuals and organisations through redundancy and restructure uh, during the pandemic and now we're in a hybrid working environment. So how do you, how did the pandemic affect kind of redundancy and outplacement practices in your experience? What different, what changes did you see over that time? Um, I think we, we saw that redundancy affects so many people of all professional levels um, and we're even seeing now that some people have had redundancy two or three times over the last few years. Um, in terms of how it's affected outplacement practices, we're able to reach people digitally. So we can do online group coaching, we can do online coaching one to one. Um, for me, I'm a firm believer in being stronger together. I would love to see more communities when it comes to job search um, out there. I run a free LinkedIn group and I've reached I've reached um, about a thousand people now with some webinars um, over the last couple of years. And what I love seeing is then people in the kind of LinkedIn group supporting each other or at least being there that when the when the when the knockbacks come, people lift each other up. And when when we're in the same boat as other people, it can be hugely beneficial. So I would love to see more communities um, out there. Um, 
The other thing, we've seen such a rise in online and remote working, but what it means is that it's harder for people to transition into new roles because they don't get to meet their team, they don't get to work face to face with them. So I have seen people go into new roles, finding it harder to transition. Um, so that's something else I've definitely noticed. What else? Um, I think the other thing is, yeah, with the with the rise of awareness of mental health and well-being, um, I would love to see more outplacement practices being more heart led, um, being more holistic as well as highly practical. That's something that I would like to see from outplacement. Sometimes it's had a bit of a reputation of being a bit like a sausage factory of just one in, one out, off you go. Whereas I believe that more holistic approach, as I said, combined with practical, um, can really help people um, into next steps. Yeah, I think the point you make, though, about the hybrid working and the amount of people maybe going through this process and now starting roles and remote working or working on a hybrid basis, that's a really important factor that probably you know, nobody really had to consider before, and that will make the transition to a new organisation and a new role more difficult. So encouraging people to to go in and meet as many people when you can and engage with as many people as possible and going through the kind of late learning, the learning and development curve with your new organisations really important in person if you can, um, because that will really help embed you into the culture and and hopefully um, you know, um, settle in better makes makes complete sense. Um, sir, from your perspective, I'm guessing um, you may well also have witnessed some similar changes in terms of how employers approach redundancy and restructuring, you know, post pandemic and, and in a hybrid working world. Have you see, seen some good practices um, from employers um, yeah. now? I, I think um, over that period of complete sort of change and everything being up in the air I think actually uh, my experience was that um, employers were probably less likely to make redundancies than we anticipated I think um, it was a, a, a very much a concern obviously we had the furlough scheme um, that, that actually saved a lot of people's jobs it was an alternative um, to redundancy that potentially just protected employment and, and gave employers that breathing space so that was obviously a, a big impact on, on redundancies now that we're way past the end of the furlough scheme I think that's why we We've now got that ACAS survey that's talking about the likelihood of redundancies in the next 12 months. Um, and I think the hybrid working impact is probably going to mean that where we're going to see perhaps some increases is office closures. Um, you know, it's certainly a, there's a lot of downsizing um, of, of office space and um, that can have employment implications, hopefully um, not necessarily triggering triggering per se a, a redundancy, but but sort of restructuring the uh, the way that businesses are operating. Um, but, you know, potentially could trigger a redundancy if they're just we're not going to have an office in Liverpool anymore. Um, it might be that the people that are there are very happy to work from home or work from another office location and they've got those alternative roles. Um, but if that's not feasible for them for whatever reason or it's it is an in office role and it's not appropriate for them to work from another location or there isn't another location um, offered to them and um, then obviously that will trigger a redundancy situation so I suspect we may see some of that. Yeah that makes that makes sense. Thank you Heather and I mean um, in terms of um, the the pandemic affecting redundancy and outplacement practices Suzanne how, how did that change um, from your perspective. Can you hear me with that one there? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, it's, to, to me, it's this, um, like I said, with communities and, and et cetera on the rise, but I think it's definitely been a lot harder to, to transition into roles and um, because of the hybrid working, because of the remote. Um, and also, yeah, yeah I, I've seen that key. Something that has helped is is I do things like colour profiling with, with individuals so that they can almost understand the personality preferences of people that when they go into that new team, they're more aware of how to um, engage and, um, and, and work better. Yeah. 
kind of get up to speed quicker. So yeah. that's been helpful. And in, and in terms of the restructures, what else do you think, you know, we've talked, Heather, you've mentioned consultation processes and part of that consultation process uh, technically means that, you know, gives the employer and the employee time to discuss and go through maybe some alternatives other than, you know, going for redundancies or doing this restructure potentially or, or a different way of doing it. So, Suzanne, have you seen, you know, situations where in potential restructures, um, what else an employer could consider before they opt for redundancy? Um, and, you know, what are those alternatives kind of that are worth considering? Before they opt for redundancy? Yeah, um, yeah like Heather said, thinking about things like can they save money on estates and um, et cetera instead, thinking about succession planning or job crafting. So how can we, if, if we can't always go upwards in an organisation, can employees stay and go maybe sideways? Um, can we retain those people as opposed to letting them go? Um, as Heather said earlier, keep it about the role and not the person. Keep it away from that performance management route. That's really important. Um, and another one, Harvard Business Review, a statistic I've got here, people are who have strong professional development opportunities are 34% more likely to stay. So can there be an opportunity for with job crafting or um, putting people into other roles, supporting them with professional development in order for them to excel and, and do well? So that's something yeah. else for people to consider. So almost upskilling and Ups you know challenging yeah. them with, with different learning and development opportunities. And given the skill shortage we've mentioned and we've talked about, you know, high employment rates and, and still very, very low unemployment rates here in the UK. What's your experience, Suzanne, of how employers are becoming more aware of the importance of how they handle restructures in terms of their reputation in the marketplace? Are you seeing a, a bit of a pattern there? I'm definitely seeing more employers wanting to offboard with care. I'm seeing more employers now say to me, we never thought about having an offboarding budget. We always we always think of a recruitment budget. So now we're planning for both. So that's been a real positive that I've seen. Um, what else, Heather, anything that you, you've seen there at all? Um, I think the reality is, like you say, skill shortage is a big thing. You know, I, I've definitely spent more time in um, you know the last that last year or so, talking to uh, businesses about um, challenges with recruitment. I I also sit on the board of a charity, so I know that was that has been their biggest um, issue. Um, so people do want to make sure they retain good people. People are aware of that cost as well around um, um, recruitment. I think obviously, um, generally speaking, if there are suitable alternative roles within a redundancy process, then um, employers really hope that employees will take those um, suitable alternative roles. There's, there's when looking at that though, there's always an objective element. The employer thinks, great, this alternative role is suitable uh, for the individual. So, you know, we hope we don't want to make you redundant. Please take this other role. But there is a personal element. There's a subjective element there. And so whilst a suitable um, alternative role might be acceptable to one person um, who's at risk of redundancy, someone else, same job title, um, same position, you know, again, I guess come back to my sales team of 10 to 5. It might be that within those five people that are selected for redundancy, there is a, there's three suitable alternative roles um, and um, one of the individuals decides, yes, I'll accept that it's suitable for me personally. But one of the others may say, no, I'm, I'm refusing it. And that might be on uh, you know grounds such as their personal circumstances, it might come down to where they live, it might come down to their health. Um, it might come down to childcare commitments, whatever it is, and, and it will generally be a reasonable refusal if it's um, f f for one of those reasons. Um, they can't just unreasonably refuse it, but if they have got some personal circumstances that mean it's not suitable for them, then they, they, they can still be made redundant and receive their statutory redundancy payment as an alternative. But I think employers generally do want impacted employees to take suitable alternatives if they exist um, 
for sure. Yeah, so they're being kind of proactive around that and thinking about it, uh, which, yeah, would definitely advise in the current current market. And um, we've talked about um, or mentioned some probably less good examples um, over the recent time. And um, there's been some high profile tech examples of poor um, restructuring and redundancy situations. Um, Heather, there have been, you know, those high profile examples where employers in the UK, uh, I suppose, if I haven't handled a, a redundancy situation well, very high profile here was P&O back. I think that was during the pandemic, but you know that that did did not um, go very well and and left them with massive reputational damage. So, what in your opinion can organisations learn from those kind of examples? I think part of it is that it's not just down to the strict legals um, and either ticking the box or not ticking the boxes. You may or may not get away with that, depending on your size and how many people we're talking about. And not every individual will look to sue and um, not, you know, not every breach of a legal um, process will result in a claim or a successful claim. But there's more than more than that risk um, as a reason for doing it right. As we've, as Suzanne's quite rightly said, impact on the people that are left behind. You may well lose people because of how badly you've treated others, and um, reputation. You know, are people going to want to work for you if you're known to treat employees like this? People do want an element of feeling they've got some job security, even though you know no no role is guaranteed, but that you would um, be treated with respect and, um, and 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 give an opportunity to have time to find alternative employment or supported with that, um, rather than uh, dismissed on the spot. And um, you know the the PO one's interesting because it was potentially dealing with seafarers, and they've got slightly different legislation, but there's there's. Um, certainly mechanisms by which uh, politicians and, and people were looking for angles to potentially punish those employers in those um, most serious cases. There is a legal obligation to notify the Secretary of State if you are looking at dismissing over a certain number of people within those 90 days, you have to fill in a HR1 form. So um, if you've not done that, there can be penalties um, and, and there's been some discussion around the p example there. Um, but ultimately it's let's try and do this right because A, yes, we don't really want to deal with claims afterwards. We do want our reputation intact. We don't want to, to have fallout wider than we were expecting and lose other good people. Um, and actually, sometimes if we consult properly, the people that are impacted have some really good ideas for how they might avoid redundancies. It might be that those 10 salespeople say, what about if we all drop down to four days a week for the next six months and saw how it went? What about if, um, you know, we work slightly differently or, um, you know, and Suzanne, you've got, got some ideas around that as well. Yeah, I'm seeing more and more people wanting flexible working. And actually, if we think about it from a candidate point of view, surveys are showing that over 60 percent of candidates want flexibility. So where is it used to be OK for employers to think about, you know, money is going to just attract these people? Actually, no, there's two key trends I've seen. One is 60, so over 60 percent want flexibility. And the other I'm noticing people are wanting more purpose, especially millennials and Generation Z are wanting more purpose. But I've got some senior directors at the moment I'm coaching and they've got a few interviews on and they want to go to the more purpose led. Um, so, you know, if they I would encourage any employers to also think about as opposed to um, redundancies, could there be some flexible in, in, in flexibility, as you said, in terms of hours um, or if you're advertising or trying to recruit people, could you consider job shares that might attract people? So it's just thinking about this. These trends have since the pandemic, the, the trends have changed in the job market. So how can we as employers attract these people? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks, Heather. And Suzanne, just to kind of conclude our discussion on a formal note and uh, or sorry, on a positive note, and then I'll try and I know there's some questions, so I'll try and um, pick up some of those uh, time allowing. But um, can you share, you know, a success or success stories on how outplacement 
has helped clients uh, and individuals navigate the kind of next chapter that you've seen recently? I've, um, I've seen people change uh, roles from um, many years in the private sector, 30 years plus in one company, go into the NHS, um, working, yeah, working with the NHS. A gentleman I supported who was in his 60s went to his first ever assessment centre. He phoned me and said, oh my gosh, I was by far the oldest people a person there. He got offered the role. He was delighted. But it was, you know, he said the job market's massively changed. Um, I've been supporting an organisation recently, um, seeing their employees through kind of that, supporting them with the redeployment. Um, and that, that's been beautiful to see people going, some people leaving to secure new roles. One lady said to me recently, she said, um, you've completely reframed my redundancy from a real negative, full of worry to now being really positive and I've landed my dream job thanks to your support. Um, which was beautiful to hear um, and we she, she got that one within literally two two months of, of leaving her organization but it still pains me when well like I said Claire when people come um, to get support because their employer didn't provide it 12 months on the job market and then they do get some professional supports and it, it, it hugely yeah. can benefit yeah yeah so it can be a positive thing Very totally good. yeah and um, so I just thought I'd try and deal with some of the questions. Heather, I'll go to you with, with a couple of these. They look a little bit more kind of from the legal, but obviously, Suzanne, if you've got any thoughts, please, please jump in. Um, there's one where someone has been diagnosed with a serious illness and um, informed their employer. Is there any protection from redundancy around that? I'm afraid the short answer is probably no. So um, if they are disabled as a result of that serious illness, then they do have the right not to be discriminated against, i.e. treated less favourably to others. So if they were then selected purely on that basis, then there would be some protection. But unlike the maternity example I gave, you don't get enhanced protection and um, there would if as I say if it amounts to a disability there would be positive obligation to make reasonable adjustments and that might include to things like any um, interview or, or, or process that they went through in order to secure suitable alternative roles um, or to you know to assess and to selection criteria and um, so sometimes absence is taken into account when looking at selection criteria but if there's disability related absence then they need to be careful around that so um, it, it may be relevant, but there is an, an, an almost automatic additional protection there from, from redundancy, I'm afraid. OK, thank you. And another question here, which I think might be more of a probably need, requires a more of a legal um, perspective. When restructuring within a group, i.e. reducing activities in one organisation, but increasing similar, but not in the similar but not the same in another, so presumably there's two organisations in this group of companies perhaps, how does TUPI and redundancy interact? Do employees transfer under TUPI automatically in that situation, Heather? So TUPI is a very complex um, area of law. From my reading of that brief fax, it doesn't sound on the face of it that two people be engaged. Um, but I think what would be relevant is where you've got associated employers and they tend to be ones within the same group. When you're searching for suitable alternative roles, you absolutely should consider the wider group. So in this scenario, if they've got people in the first company where the reduction in activities is happening and so people might be at risk of redundancy, but they're great, they've got this exciting similar work in another group company, then offer them roles in that other group company as an alternative to redundancy. 2P generally only applies where you've got um, a, if, it, if you were either selling part of that business or completely sort of moving that business from one group company to another or it related to a particular contract say that was moving from one company to another so I think it's unlikely that 2P is happening there you might want to transfer their employment by virtue of a, an alternative to redundancy but it wouldn't happen automatically by 2P it would be because they would accept an alternative role with the other group company. Right, thank you, Heather. Um, Suzanne, just one for you. Um, you know, you're talking to individuals a lot and you, you support individuals going through the process. Um, 
you know, where can an individual go to to get specifically legal advice? Because they're obviously aware you support them through the, the physical process of job searching and, you know, presenting themselves on LinkedIn and, and that whole, you know, interviews, etc. But, you know, where perhaps they might they because the organization perhaps is getting legal advice from their legal advisors, which makes sense. But where have you seen individuals can go to get a little bit more support in terms of their legal rights during the process, Suzanne? ACAS is always a really good one. So to me, ACAS has been very, very good. And even when I had redundancy in the past as well, ACAS were great. So that's one that I would recommend, Citizens Advice. Heather, any others from your point yeah, of view there for legal? ACAS are really good, but they can't give advice, legal advice to individuals. So they're a neutral body that can try and help resolve disputes. So absolutely um, can be useful, but can't actually provide advice. Um, so yes, absolutely, citizens advice might be a good place, um, or otherwise, obviously, looking for um, firms that specialise in, in in providing um, advice to individuals, and that they are employment specialists. But um, you know, ho hopefully, if the employers got things right, that there is mechanism within the consultation process, they um, generally should be given the right to appeal against the dismissal. So it might be that they, you know, can explore the alternative internal um, but then bearing in mind that um, they do have um, a, a legal time limit of, of generally three months from the date of any dismissal if they do feel it's unfair and it has infringed their rights to potentially make a claim and they don't necessarily need a lawyer to do that. Um, you can issue a claim, it doesn't cost you anything, um, you do need to speak to ACAS first um, but it is possible within the employment sphere to, to do it without a solicitor. Great, thank you, Heather. And I think this will be our last one, but I think again, it's probably more legal than than anything else. But of course, Suzanne, if you have an opinion, if there are fixed term contracts and perm people doing the same role, and there's a need for a reduction in roles, so you're reducing the roles, can the fixed term contracts be ended? I'm guessing sooner, uh, probably ended at that point, rather than pooling them in with the permanent employees. This person is asking to protect the, the permanent staff uh, over, a, I suppose, the FTC. Sorry, Heather. It's a really good question and it actually comes up quite a lot. And again, the short answer is um, probably no. So fixed term um, employees have the right not to be um, treated less favourably due to their fixed term status, um, which is um, not necessarily that known about or, or, or litigated about, but it would be relevant here. So the fact by their nature that their fixed term shouldn't be a reason to select them in effect for redundancy and actually even expiry of a fixed term contract amounts to a dismissal. So if the fixed term contracts lasted two years or more, they do have unfair dismissal rights in the same way as a permanent employee does. So um, actually it's generally the right thing to include them. Um, the difference would be if you had temporary staff like agency staff, that sort of thing, that would be a route to look at to try and protect your directly employed people um, to try and obviously reduce overheads and costs looking at agency. Um, but um, targeting just those people on a fixed term contract by nature of them purely being fixed term is generally not um, the, the, the best idea. OK, that, that makes sense. So I, I, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. And um, thanks to everyone who joined our session.